WNYC TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and. This is about the arts, and our guest today is a lively and versatile and distinguished contributor to them. A very warm welcome to you, Kitty Carlisle Hart. Thank you very much. You've been an actress. You are an actress, a singer, a television personality. And now, as chairwoman of the New York State Council on the Arts, you are the arts administrator of the most substantial, both in terms of impact and dollars and cents, arts agency in the entire country. How does your former life compare to your current one, at least as an arts person? Well, you know, um, I, my children are grown, and I am alone, and you must fill your life with activity, and I feel that this is far more important and much more interesting and exciting than filling my life with the usual thing that ladies fill their lives with, even though they are actresses and working people. Unfortunately, the theater is in, in a state now where you don't work all the time. And I manage to work and do my job at the Arts Council. And I feel very fortunate to have this much to do. I think it's very exciting, and it keeps me young and healthy. <laughs> well, that is evident. <laughs> What's a day like for you? Well, I tell Who's you one thing. The there is one thing Council that's changed though. a lot, and that is, you know, when I was in the theater, uh, nobody called me before 11. Uh, so the other morning, the phone rang at 10 after 8, and it was a lady on the other end who obviously expected me to pick up the phone, which I did. That's a big change. Um, I, I find that every single solitary moment is taken up with either planning, strategy, uh, warding off uh, blows, putting out fires, and generally being very proud of the organization that I'm with. Well, that organization is very proud of you. Just yesterday, I heard you refer to as the great conciliator. Oh. <laughs> I suspect that is the result of uh, a rather difficult legislative session with the New York State Council on the Arts, whose budget was $27 million last year, had expected $34 million for the coming year. How did that all end up? Well, we got $30 million, and we're not through yet. I have a kind of bulldog character. I get my teeth into something and I can't seem to let go until I got what I, what I set out to do. We have a supplemental budget coming up. And uh, this is the first year that I read real signs of a possibility of the restoration of the $3 million that we lost in the supplemental budget. And I'm asking everyone who is within the sound of my voice to please go to work on your legislators and make sure that we do get that extra money. In the approximately 17 years that the State Arts Council has been in existence, I guess one hasn't tallied up, at least in conversation, how much money in all has been given, but it's certainly upwards of perhaps 400 to $500 million. Has all that money really made a difference in the cultural life of our state and in turn our country? Well, I think one of the things that it's accomplished has been that it's made uh, New York State and New York City the art capital of the world. If you've ever been abroad, you know that uh, the arts in, in foreign capitals have a major museum, uh, a major um, opera house, one or two major government theaters, musical comedy and a serious theater. But the proliferation, the excitement, the kind of, kind of uh, smorgasbord that you pick up the New York Times or the, any newspaper and you look and you see there are 19 things you want to do every day. Uh, the, the variety, we've also, it is because of the State Arts Council that New York State, New York City, has become the, art, the dance capital of the world. That's because of the Arts Council and the money we've spent. Um, How much money do you think has gone towards the dance? I and has that been because you recognized a growing audience for dance? You recognized the increase in companies? Yes, b both. The g demand, uh, audience participation, audience need. You see, it's very hard to say which comes first, the, the chicken or the egg. But I do know that in spite of the fact that most people feel that the, that the artist will perform no matter what, paid or unpaid, and that is true, nevertheless, patronage makes the arts flourish. In Europe in the old days, the kings, the queens, and the dukes 
made Michelangelo, the popes, made great art. And it is where the patronage is that the arts will flourish. And the, the patronage of the, of the government, the state government, is totally essential for the flourishing of the arts. Without the Arts Council, there'd be no off-off Broadway. It would fold. Sometimes the obverse side of that is raised, and that is the possibility of dissipating resources, however limited they are. We're talking in very grand numbers, but not when you realize the numbers of people that are served both as performers and administrators in these various and small, institutions. And small organizations. So is there the possibility of dissipating these resources on what are sometimes considered marginal efforts while major institutions and organizations go wanting? This is always a problem. And I feel sometimes like a mother with three children, um, the three children being the major institutions, the emerging and experimental institutions, smaller institutions, and uh, all of those uh, regional institutions and organization and artists out in, in, in the various counties. And you know, actually, it, it sort of works like being on a tightrope. When you raise children, you, sometimes you're too permissive and sometimes you're too tough. You're always falling off on one side or the other. N in the main, I think we do an awfully good job in maintaining our balance. And balance is the operative word. It really is a balance. Well, how do you make sure that the right people get the money? Well, you see, that's a very, very good question because I'm proud of the process of the council. The legislature, in their wisdom, set up a very good system, which is a system of checks and balances. Uh, every organization is looked at for fiscal responsibility and artistic quality by the staff. Uh, then this request goes to a panel of peers, people in the field who know the discipline, who judge their own people who are artistically qualified. Then it goes to a subcommittee of the council that adjudicates differences between the subcommittee and between the panel and the staff, if there are any differences in requests in the funding. And then it goes to a whole council, a full council, which is 20 members um, appointed by the governor. And so every request goes through about, I should say, Oh, 35 to 40 hands. Well, on its face, that does sound like the most equitable kind of procedure, but is it possible for panels of experts, no matter how dedicated, no matter how committed they are, to review the hundreds, the perhaps thousands and thousands yes, yes, of applications because, Oh, yes, oh, yes, because actually the small applicants sometimes get more time than the large ones um, because, you see, it's divided up into disciplines. We have 12 separate divisions and 12 separate panels. Now, they do a lot of work, it's quite true, but each one doesn't review hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They mm -hmm. review their own uh, division. Mm -hmm. And they are all reviewed, I promise you. We talked before about the budget for New York State, and you mentioned New York City specifically. New York City tries to convince the rest of the country, <coughs> excuse me, and I think quite rightly, that it is a national cultural resource. It's I true. I sometimes wonder <laughs> if there is equally successful in persuading New York State. There is that undercurrent of hostility. It's not hostility. It's a uh, feeling that uh, New York City gets the lion's share. Does it? No, that's not true. Because we have managed to fulfill our per capita requirement, which means that every person in the state of New York gets 55 cents of our budget per county. And every county has been fully funded for the first time this year, which means that our staff, which is so brilliant and so hardworking and so dedicated, has managed to develop arts resources in all of these counties which are worth funding. And this takes a lot of time and a lot of development and a lot of going out of town. And I have traveled the length and breadth of this state in order to prove by my presence that we care as much about Binghamton and Rochester and, and Watertown and Syracuse as we do about New York City. And also I've been to the various boroughs because they also think they might be too shortchanged, which they're not. <laughs> I guess other than that division of funding relates to what is the principal philosophical debate that rages in the arts currently. In rather fancy terms, it's generally referred to as elitism versus, versus populism. populism. <laughs> Excellence and access. How do you come out on that debate? Well, we feel that uh, there is no difference between a first-class jazz festival and a first-class Bach festival. It's just got to be first class, that's all. And it's as simple as that. I feel that uh, the Metropolitan Opera, 
which could have had a charge of elitism leveled at it, is now going to get rid of all of that um, bad feeling because the uh, li live from the Met is, is bringing the opera to so many people. And it's very well done. Do you think it's going to develop new audiences? Oh, it has already. <coughs> I find <coughs> when I go... When I go upstate and I, and I talk to the various opera companies, by the way, that's another thing that we've done, which is extraordinary. In my day, a singer had to go abroad to get the experience in order to come back and sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Today, no singer has to go to Europe to get experience. There are 40 opera companies, 40 or 45 opera companies around the state. And when I went around the state and I would run into an opera company that was going to do, let's say, a bohème, right after the Metropolitan had done bohème on television, they were worried for fear their performances would be hurt by the fact that an audience had already seen it on television. The reverse was true. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get in. They could have given three performances for every one. Obviously, the same thing has happened with dance as well. Right. The recent Joffrey Ballet performance right. has a report that says that one performance on live television would have equaled 39 years of playing to full houses. And what it has done is help to increase and develop an audience as well. That's right, for smaller companies. Mm -hmm. uh, ab it's absolutely true. But that is in the instances the rare instances, actually, of the live from Lincoln centers. In general, how do you feel about media coverage of the arts? Oh, I think it's vital. I think it's terribly important, and yes. it's getting better and better. And I wish we had a network in New York State that would cover all of the activities of the arts in New York State. We could do it on, on NET, which would be marvelous. Well, but why don't you? Well, um, it, it's been a complicated thing to do because there's been a feeling of conflict of interest. Uh, there, I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to mm -hmm. be the one to be the spokesman. A perfect and they, spokesperson. And they felt that it was uh, a conflict of interest. I tell you the truth, I never understood why. But here you are, a performer, all the while, yeah. you also serve as the chairwoman. And I was going to do it for nothing, mind you. I didn't expect to get paid. How do you spend your holidays? Well, I'm going off to Barbados. I have a friend who has a beautiful house in Barbados. And last year, I went to go on a friend's yacht. I had never spent a night on a yacht. But the gods decided that I really wasn't chic enough <laughs> to go yachting. Because when I got there, it turned out he loaned his yacht. He chartered it to somebody else. And I never got to go to sea. <laughs> what I was really leading the witness to is that you spend your vacations in the arts, too, but this time performing. That's and I right. was really thinking of your oh, summer, this summer experience. Oh, this summer I'm going to do summer stock. Yeah, I'm going to do summer stock. I haven't chosen a play yet. They don't write plays anymore for ladies like me. So it's got to be a revival. And I've been reading all kinds of plays. If you had but your druthers, what would it be? And I'd like to do a new play. But they just, as I say, they don't write plays for ladies like me anymore. No one in all of the state of New York? Apparently <laughs> not, no. But I might like to do uh, a musical of Morse's, my husband, called a Lady in the Dark, which oh. I did do some years ago. It has a lovely score by Kurt Weill, and that's a possibility. But I haven't chosen yet. But I am going to work this summer. Last summer, I took the whole summer off and gave it all to the council, except for the two weeks when I didn't get, get to go yachting. <laughs> do you ever plan to write your own memoir? I would love to be able to do that. But you know, Morse wrote the best theatrical autobiography ever written called Act One. And I have that as a kind of model, and I could never come anywhere near it. So it stymies me. Actually, a line that you quoted earlier reminded me of a line from Act One. And the line is what that you said was that no one ever expected to call me before 11. And as I recall, there is a reference in the book that uh, after the first success of Moss Hearts, he decided to wend his way to Manhattan. And the first thing he was going to do was to give up getting up early in the morning. And I think the line went, any sunrise that was good at 6 would be just <laughs> as good at 11. <laughs> well, obviously, he persuaded you to that point of view. Oh, yes, he was adamant about that. And nobody was ever allowed. As a matter of fact, when we got married, I suggested that we have a double bed. And he said, double bed? Why, my valet's not allowed to speak to me before noon. <laughs> <laughs> he gave up that idea very quickly. <laughs> Speaking of philosophy, I was thinking that... Uh, most private funding agencies express 
the philosophy either of its founders or its board members. How does the philosophy of a public funding agency evolve? Well, I think it evolves, it grows a little bit like Topsy. Uh, at the moment, the philosophy of the council is to bring as much good art as we can to the people and to bring as many people as we can to the arts. Is that populism? Not people. People aren't populism. People who come to a good jazz festival are just as elitist as the people who go to a, a good Bach festival, I think. Um, I don't believe that we can, that we can shortchange the major institutions because they are what the future generations have to look to, to become. Uh, on the other hand, if we don't fund the grassroots, where are the future generations going to get their beginnings and their interest and where are the audience is coming from? How many arts groups does the State Council fund annually? We had a, uh, a we, the last year's request was uh, 1,876 and we funded 1,092. So you can see that it's a vast uh, amount of work. And of that number, in a recent interview with Nancy Hanks, a woman with whom you share you know, a great deal in common, I asked her about the question of major institutions in this country. And we talked about the whole question of, you know, should a country set aside 10 or 12 or 15 national treasures that come what may, they should be funded. There is only one Metropolitan Opera. There is only one, I'm about to cite all New York City instances, Metropolitan Museum. Well, shall we say the, the Smithsonian Institution. Thank we'll, give, you. we'll give Washington yes. something, too. Should we as a country, in general, pick out our national treasures and say, come what may, they must be supported? Oh, absolutely. No question about it. But you see, that's not the case. It's really uh, the question of major institutions versus... No, I don't think it's versus anything. I really don't. I think choices have to be made. But then we make choices every day when we pick up the toothbrush. Uh, we've got... Uh, some of us use some kind of dentifrice and some of us use others. Everything is a choice. And so I don't mind making these choices. And I think that uh, because we do fund a great many uh, community, and we have a new project now, you know, which is called decentralization, which gives regranting privileges to organizations to regrant $3,000 and under outside of New York City, outside of the metropolitan area. And this is in order to allow communities to do what they want to do in terms that we might not at the council, our guidelines would not let us participate in because they might not be that professional. There are two other new programs that the council has instituted uh, this year. One uh, that I'm thinking of relates to the adaptive reuse of existing structures, really the arts and found places. And rather than that happening on an ad hoc and random basis, you have decided to give a more formal structure to that, economic studies, feasibility studies. Can you tell us something about that program? Well, do you think the fact that they've uh, rehabilitated all those wonderful old movie houses upstate, would that fall into that category? It certainly does. Oh, well, I've been to all of them. They're marvelous. There was one wonderful one in Buffalo called Shays Buffalo, and they gave me a luncheon. And they took me in the front door very grandly, and they said, this is what we've done to rehabilitate this beautiful old movie house. It's like the Roxy was, you mm -hmm. know. And I said, well, I do feel very much at home here, but I would have felt much more at home if you'd let me go in the back door, because I played here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I played Chase Buffalo in vaudeville. Uh, I've been to the Stanley in Utica. As I've a performer? No, no, this is just oh. to see what they've done. Oh, they've done wonderful things, and they're all operating now. I mean, they're going full blast. Do you have any plans, however, to go to 6th Avenue and 50th Street? Do you plan to involve yourself in the Radio City Music Hall struggle? Well, I think it would be nice if they had a year to see if there were some way in which they could keep it as a theater. Um, on the other hand, I must tell you that I played in a in a theater in Radio City called the Center Theater, which seated 3,300 people, 3,300 people in Radio City. And what was my dressing room is now Al Marshall's office. So, you know, things change. 
I would be very sad to see Radio City go as a theater. I'm always sad to see a theater go. Uh, but it's, it's perfectly possible that they might be able to keep it as, a, as an art form and put something on top of it, which would make it feasible. Does the State Council have any position? No, we couldn't that? have because we have much too little money to get involved in that, mm -hmm. much too little. Of all the roles you've ever played, what is your favorite one? You mean parts on the stage? Yeah. I think Prince Olofsky and the Flater Mouse, because I played that at the Metropolitan Opera. And that was very recently, wasn't it was that recently. several years ago? Yes, it was. I got to sing at the Metropolitan Opera in Flater Mouse in a part of a prince, because, you know, there are a lot of girls' part, boys' parts played by girls in the opera, and uh, with my black tights up to here. And uh, I said to my children, if Mama can make her debut <laughs> at the Metropolitan <laughs> Opera at her age, you must never despair because anything can happen to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Do you practice every day? Almost every day, yes. And I have a singing teacher and a coach, and I work at it. It's the only way. Is there any role you aspire to now? Performing part, that is, or other? Well, I'd like to do Orlovsky all over again. I, en I enjoyed that. I love the music because it's so gay and such fun. I was once in a, mo in a play called Three Waltzes on Broadway, and like all musical comedy actresses, I had an enormous respect for the, for the um, sort of awe, really, of the legitimate theater, so to speak. And next door, they were playing a play called Shadow and Substance with Sir Cedric Hardwick and Julie Harris, very, very classy, straight actors. And our stage doors abutted, so they said to me, do come over one day and watch the beginning of our show. And so I came in full makeup, and <clears throat> I went over to their play, and it was all very quiet. And the stage manager said, on stage, Sir Cedric. And then there was tiptoeing around, and then he said, on stage, Miss Harris, more tiptoeing around. I got more and more depressed as I watched this backstage. And I went back to my backstage, and the chorus girls were running up and down the stairs, and the stage manager was saying, get your mm -hmm on stage, <laughs> and hurry up, and the orchestra was playing, and the overture was going, and I thought, oh, I think mine's better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're all the time hearing that the theater is a fabulous invalid other that than this a, year. That was a, uh, a phrase that my husband coined, a play called The Fabulous Invalid. Yeah. Except for this yes. year. Yes, oh, it's marvelous. Never bef that I can ever recall in my limited perception, I guess, uh, has Broadway enjoyed the kind of success that it has uh, during the current season. But there are still a number of underdeveloped cultural activities in the city and in the state. And what would be the most underdeveloped one? And what would you do to remedy it? Well, uh, I think that if I were to ask our constituents, I would, they would say that the minority arts are perhaps underdeveloped, not in terms of the amount of money we g they get or in terms of the, of the support that the council tries to give. But I think one of the things that's missing in our, in, in our pieces is first-rate arts administration. I wish I could get a lot of young people into arts administration. It would help small dance companies. It would help uh, all of the ethnic companies. It would help all the emerging young people who are s come into the theater because they want to dance, they want to perform, they, they want the arts, but they haven't got the know-how to keep their books. And it would be so helpful to them, to us, if we could get more people into the arts administration business. Other than the arts administration business, what advice would you give to a young person who wanted to make a life in the arts? Don't do it. I would say don't do it, and the reason I would say don't do it is because anyone who make, wants to make a life in the arts does it no matter what you say. And like that's one the of your own only children. way to <laughs> do it, exactly. It's the only way. You must do it because if you didn't do it, you'd die. And that's the only way it's any good, because it's full of hardships, it's full of sacrifice, and it's full of times when there are no jobs. That's the toughest. And as an actress, I find that very difficult. You have and had a very rich, full life. Why do you take on such a battering, bruising, however gratifying job you have I now? I think I can tell you, because I, I sort of sorted it out 
you know, I was vice chairman of the Arts Council for quite a long time. Six years, I Five believe. years. Mm -hmm. And I sensed a dissatisfaction with the council before I was asked to take it on. I sensed a dissatisfaction in the constituents, in the legislature, and in the council itself. And I was determined not to let it go down the drain because I believe in government funding for the arts. I believe that it's a vital piece of the health of the arts. And I wanted to make sure that it, it stayed healthy and viable. One of the things we hear all the <laughs> it sounds Ugh. vaguely obscene. <laughs> no, it sounds, it's, it's a cliche. But anyway, I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> but you, you do raise an important question, and that is the kind of specter that it, we have raised all around us these days are fears of 15 and 20 years ago, and that is the relationship of government and culture. This not very far down the road, the potential politicalization of the Well, arts. you know, I'm glad you brought that up because there was a headline in the New York Times the other day that said the Arts Council needs help or lessons or something in, in politics. Well, I'm very glad they said that because it shows that the Arts Council is not politicized, that we are an independent body and we base our judgments on quality. And if maybe if we were more politicized, uh, we wouldn't have lost $3 million. But I prefer to think that it's better not to be politicized. And we'll get it back anyway. <laughs> However, um, hearings took place around the country very recently. In fact, you participated in the ones that were held in New York to see if there was support for a White House conference on the arts and humanities in 1979 and 80. Do you think that is a good idea? And are there any subjects, if it does take place, and now it appears that it will since there is legislation yes. before the Congress, what subjects should be covered? I think it's a good idea. Um, I think employment and the arts should be covered. I think uh, the CETA program should be covered. I don't think there's enough, uh, there are enough CETA jobs for the arts. I think, um, uh, oh, there's a whole range of things that should be covered. I think that um, the, the, the uh, federal government should provide more money for the arts. Um, I feel that uh, the federal government funds all of the arts as if all of the states were equal, and some of us are more equal than others. <laughs> you among them. Thank you, Kitty Carlisle Hart, for talking to us about arts, aesthetics, dollars, with a great deal of sense. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being with us, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too.